Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IMC NCR webinar. It's our pleasure to have an amazing speaker sharing her expertise and talents with us today. Erin Austin is a strategic lawyer and a consultant. She uses her years of practicing law, including roles as a COO and general counsel at large and small IP-driven companies to help founders of expertise-based firms build and protect their saleable assets. So for all of us, that means we can ensure our businesses are ready to sell when the founders are ready to exit. So I know Aaron has worked long and hard on this topic and put together some really great ideas to help all of us who are consultants with uh, what might be next for our companies. Aaron is also a member of our chapter of the IMC and Linda Howard is here as well as Cleveland Parker who are also on the board of the IMC. And we have another event scheduled for next week which is on Wednesday, May 18th. We have a great happy hour conversation um, and we'll be talking about, um, what are we talking about, Linda? Keep uh, Managing it. client relationships. Managing client relationships. Right. I know it was a great idea we came up with. So that will be our event for next week. We are recording this session and um, I'd like to turn it over to Erin. Uh, thank you so much, Lois and Linda and Cleveland for having me back again. Uh, very pleased to to address uh, IMC for the third time uh, about you know the very sexy topic of intellectual property. You know everyone loves it, and uh, and so uh, as we go through this, um, please you know keep your question you know have your questions ready. Um, if there's something that I mentioned that you have a, an immediate question about, please feel free to pop it in the chat, and I think Lois or Linda will be monitoring it and and let me know. Um, but otherwise, I'm definitely going to leave time for questions at the end. And uh, and so, um, yeah, so we are here to talk about um, how to scale your business um, by licensing your expertise. And I love to talk about this topic because there is only so much uh, of our time that we can bill. So, you know, unless, you know, we are Tony Robbins, I think, you know, gets like a million bucks a day or something like that. Um, there's going to be a cap on our ability to grow our businesses based on me, Aaron Austin, as the expert, Linda as the expert, Cleveland as the expert. So what we're going to talk about when we talk about licensing is converting our business from an expert based business, which I call, you know, expert for sale to an expertise based business where we're packaging it in a way that it can be delivered by someone other than an expert. Uh, that you know is on your payroll, and uh, and that is the way that we decouple our income from our time, and we are able to build leverage into our business so we can increase profits as we're increasing our revenues. So um, what we'll be talking about today? I'll make sure I got this right. So what we're going to talk about today, you know, an overview of what licensing is, the types of licensing programs which that would be uh, appropriate for this audience. Um, whether or not your business is appropriate for licensing, um, the benefits of a, of a licensing program, and of course, there's always going to be some risk, risk and reward goes together, and, uh, and what you can do to make sure your business is ready uh, if you think licensing would be good for you. So first, what is licensing? So a license is an agreement. So the license is the agreement where the owner of an intellectual property asset, and that owner is the licensor, grants permission to a third party user, that third party user is the licensee, grants that third party user the right to use that intellectual property in some prescribed manner. So that agreement is going to have the parameters of that use, the term, the you know maybe there's some restrictions on how they can use it uh maybe there uh there's a license fee of course um maybe there are some restrictive covenants in there about you know who who they're allowed to uh, use it with so that is a written agreement and it is specific the term license is specific to intellectual property so there are other ways in which an owner can grant rights to use a property that under other names, real estate, an owner can grant a tenant right to use that property using a lease. 
um, someone who has equipment that they rent out, they can grant rights to use that equipment under a rental agreement. Um, but the important thing is that the ownership of the asset stays with the owner and that we're just granting them rights to use it per the specific terms in that license agreement. And so what a license is not is it's not a franchise. They're kind of similar and you and there are ways to get into trouble with a license that makes it a franchise. And the reason it's trouble is because license, uh, franchises are very highly regulated. There are special laws regarding them. Every state has a different franchise law. So it's something that um, needs to be addressed very specifically. Um, and that, that's to protect the licensees. And so to distinguish a license from a franchise, a franchise is uh, like the business in a box. So that is the McDonald's or a service-based one with the uh, H&R Block, I'm pretty sure is a franchise. And where they are prescribing exactly how the business is operated. These are, you know, this is the way it's gonna look. These are the marketing materials you're gonna use. This is how you're gonna price it. This is how you're gonna deliver it. Everything, the entire operation, marketing, delivery of the business is prescribed versus a license, which I like to look at is like a menu item. So uh, so you have a restaurant, you know, if your restaurant is McDonald's, it's a franchise. If your restaurant is, you know, Aaron's Cafe, but I have uh, Coca-Cola in there, I have a license to use that Coca-Cola. It's not my whole business. So, um, and then also, to, you know, sometimes uh, licenses are confused with like business licenses, the things that you get from your county or location in order to, to operate. So we're talking specifically about that intellectual property license today. So the types of licensing that would be of interest to this, this audience, um, you know, licensing is a, 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 a creature of contract. And therefore, a license can look like anything. There's all sorts of configurations. It's just a matter of negotiating them. But when we are the expertise-based business, we're consultants, and we're looking to scale our business using our expertise, there's two in particular types of licensing programs that I want to talk about today. So one is the train the trainer, and this is when your client becomes your licensee. And the other is the independent provider, where your licensees are third party service providers, maybe competitors, who are going to deliver your offering to their clients. So under the train the trainer, this one is of particular interest to you. If your clients are corporations, you have corporate clients, and you provide a service that they need on a recurring basis throughout today's program, I'm going to use an example of an HR consultant. And so that let's use that in an example um, where you're going in on a regular basis, you do um, diversity training. And so every quarter or something, you go in and train a new cohort of new employees um, or retrain them uh, with a diversity training program. Uh, that would be an example of, of the train the trainer of of being a good option for the trainer trainer. The other may be you have a hybrid, you do high end strategy work, but then also to make sure that strategy is implemented because we know we want our strategies to actually um, be implemented, our, our clients get the value from them, that you then have a long term implementation. And that is probably a lower profit work for you. And so to be able to uh, train your clients to do that implementation to have somebody in house who can help make sure that impl implementation happens is another way to structure a licensing program. On the independent producer side, independent provider side. So this is when you're licensing your expertise to another provider. So let's go to that uh, HR consultant who specializes in diversity training. And let's say there's another HR consultant who um, you know, specializes in ADA compliance, and but she wants to add some diversity training, that's not her expertise, like she's familiar, but doesn't you know, have your expertise. So she may license from you the materials that you already have created regarding this program, regarding diversity training, and then she would 
uh, deliver, she would add that as a menu item to what she's already delivering to her clients. So that would be a, a very good example of, of licensing. Um, it may be, you know, if what you do is location dependent. So you may, um, it may be a new provider where, where they are new to uh, diversity training. Let's say, you know, you're in the DC area and you only work locally because you're doing in-person um, uh, trainings and there's someone in Atlanta who wants to do local in-person trainings and then you might license your entire program to them um, and they do that, but, but that license would actually say, you know, you just do that in Atlanta. Um, and so those are, are, are two way, types of licensing programs that uh, may apply to this audience. So how do we know if your business is, uh, licensing is a good fit for your business? So there are four things, I, I will say, I didn't realize that I would take up the whole screen with my, my slides, I didn't tend to do that. Um, that there are four things that we want to make sure you have in place before you proceed with uh, trying to structure a licensing program. The first three will apply to both of the types, the client as licensee and the third party provider as licensee. The fourth would apply just to the latter. So one, you're going to need to have a proprietary process or methodology. You need to own it exclusively. Um, we'll talk more in depth later about um, why that is important. Um, so, but if it's something that, if you do something kind of ordinary, like let's say you uh, are a web designer and what you do is, you know, you have your master license from WordPress and you get, you know, you have some sort of intake form that people tell you what they want and then you program it up for them and you send it to them. Well, that's not proprietary. There's nothing unique about it um, that someone's going to license that from you. So it needs to have some unique proprietary aspect to it. It has to be systematized. If you know the magic is just in your brain and it's not something that has been has some processes and documentation and systems around it that you can train someone else to deliver it, then it doesn't work. You know, all of us probably have that person in our life who can, you know, cook, you know, the heck out of something, but they could not possibly tell you how to do it. You know, just kind of, you know, put a dash of this and a splash of that and stir it and taste it. If it doesn't taste right, then do something else. Like that doesn't work. Um, no matter how good it is, if somebody else can't figure out, you can't teach someone else how to do it, then that doesn't work. That's not um, going to work for a licensing program. And then there needs to be market demand. And the easy way to know if you have that is, do you have clients that you just can't get to? Do you have a wait list? Um, or are there other people in your industry that are asking, like they have clients that are asking for this that they can't serve because they don't have that particular expertise. So you want to make sure that there is market demand before as well. Um, and then, so those three uh, apply to both. You know, your clients will know that uh, they want more of you than you can give them um, in that case. So, and then the fourth would be that successful track record for the third party licensees, the third party provider licensees. They want to know if I'm going to pay you a license fee, that what I'm getting works, that, you know, there's client testimonials, you have successful track record, it is effective. And so you'll need to have something that shows that if you pay me this license fee, you use my uh, process or methodology that you will have similar success to what I've had and have happy clients, of course. So what are the benefits of a licensing program? Well, beauty of beauties, positive cash flow and recurring income. License fees are paid up front. You do not bill in arrears for your license fees. You pay them at the beginning of uh, the, you receive them at the beginning of the term. So whether it's on an annual basis, monthly, quarterly, I mean, that would be something that um, may depend on the nature of your um, license um, or, or, or the property. Um, it may make sense to do, um, May, it makes sense to do it on, on a monthly basis, but typically they're paid on an annual basis. Certainly the types of things that we're talking about, it would probably the main benefit would become, would come from a long-term license period. Um, and that would be paid 100% upfront. 
um, and of course it is recurring. So when you have a contract that renews annually, um, just don't guarantee they won't they won't uh, terminate, of course. But um, if you have a a program that's working for them, you already know that you have demand. You know that it works. Uh, you can have some predictability in the income that you'll have that recurring income year after year. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, as you add uh, licensees, it continues to grow as well. It also helps you solidify your brand and your positioning much more quickly than you can do with one on one services. Um, as we'll talk about, we're going to talk through an example in a minute, like how you can serve more people as a licensee, then you can serve them as a one-on-one -on -one client, especially if you're traveling and doing in-person services. Um, and so this is a very prime example of leverage because you are uh, creating an asset that can be uh, exploited without you personally. And so you are creating some independence from you and uh, creating an asset that can be utilized by other people. And of course, when you have an expert based business, your experts are your most expensive resource, right? I mean, you know, unless you have office space, which probably not if you do, um, you as the expert are your most expensive resource and to grow using additional experts is going to be another expensive uh, expense item. So these are the benefits of, of creating a licensing program. I in particular love them because you know one of the things as meant as uh, Lois mentioned at the beginning is I work with clients on that that journey from a, the non sustainable kind of hourly business model to a sustainable one that can hopefully be sold someday and that licensing really hits all the markers of the things that you want in your business if you want to build a business that can scale and be sold someday and those things are building exclusivity into your, into your business intellectual property is a legal monopoly so that is very exclusive um, you're creating predictability in your business again that recurring revenue um, and that you have that unique market position the more licensees you bring on the more your methodology becomes known in the business um, the the better brand recognition that you get, the more valuable your business becomes to a third party. So, so it really hits all kind of the, the checks, all the marks for creating a saleable business as well. So now we're going to talk about a, an example. And please, I, I, I didn't want to put a screen full of text here, so I'm going to read it to you. And so if, at any time you're confused about anything you need to, need to repeat anything stick a note in in the in the chat and uh, and I can repeat it for you. So we're going to use Sally as our HR consultant as our example. So Sally uh, its current revenue is $300,000 a year and she gets that by providing proprietary diversity training in person one day trainings $300,000 per one day in person training she currently delivers 100 trainings per year 3000 times 100 her is her $300,000 and she delivers it to 20 clients um, so that is about 100 uh, per year is about two per week and so plus she has the travel on top of it because she does it in person. So she has that 20 clients to derive that $300,000 from. So on average, each client is worth about $15,000. And her goal is to grow her revenue by 50% over the next year. So that would be to $450,000. Um, so to do that at $3,000 a day uh, training, she would need to do 150 trainings per year she cannot possibly do that herself so if she wants to both you know and the 100 even is too much two a week is too much anyway so that's not even sustainable so she wants to reduce her hours as well so if she wants to reduce her hours while growing her revenue she needs to add another expert so here is growing her revenue by adding an expert that expert-based business so she adds another expert 
Now, each of them are splitting the load. Each of them are doing 75 trainings uh, for a total of 150 trainings, $3,000 per training. So her training revenue is now 450. She's increased it by 50%. She has doubled the number of experts. She now has two experts. I'm attributing $175, $175,000 per year in expert costs. These are gross costs before expenses, and these will be your expert costs. Um, so I've doubled the number of experts. My expert costs are now 350,000. Look what happened to my gross profit from 125 to 100. My revenue per expert is from 300 to 225. Uh, and my gross profit per expert has gone down but from 125 per expert to 50,000 per expert. So yes, she's increased her revenue, but she has not increased her profit margins. So now let's look at an example where she grows her revenue by licensing. So here, instead of hiring another expert, she adds an option for her clients to choose where she will train their HR team to deliver her diversity training, and she will license to them all of her materials. And so now her client is a licensee. Those who choose this option would become a licensee. And so instead of paying the approximately 15,000 per client that she's been uh, getting previously, this license will be $10,000 per year. And so it is a 33% savings for the client. And instead of being limited to the th five sessions per year for the, you know, the 3000 times five to get to the 15,000, they can, uh, once their, once their team is trained, they can deliver that training monthly without having any incremental, uh, third party cost to delivering that training. And so it is good for the client as well. And so let's say that half of her clients, she had 10 client, uh, 20 clients, 10 of them stay in-person uh, training clients and 10 of them elect to become licensees. And so now those 10 that have switched over has freed up a lot of her time and she can take on another 20 licensing pro, uh, clients. So now instead of 20 in-person clients, she has 10 in-person clients and 30 licensees. And so now her revenue breakdown will be the 10 that is each is at approximately 15,000 per year, 150,000 for her training revenue. And then she has 30 at $10,000 each for $300,000 in licensing revenue. So combined, She's hit her $450,000 revenue target. Number of experts, still one. Gross numbers, she'll need to add an admin, certainly, but she won't need to hire another $175,000 expert. So her expert costs remain 175. Her gross profit has more than doubled from 125 to 275. Her revenue per expert has gone up and her gross profit per expert, of course, has gone up uh, the same percentage. So this is why I'm a huge fan of licensing um, when we have a business that it makes sense for, that we have those elements that we talked about earlier. So, well, are there risks? I know, um, you know, we all worry about uh, what happens when someone gets a hold of my secret sauce. And are there risks? Yes. But when we have risks, we mitigate those risks. And there are a number of strategies that we can follow to help make sure we mitigate that risk. One is our legal protections. So intellectual property is protected by intellectual property laws. And so we want to make sure that all of our materials are registered in the Copyright Office. If there is a trademark associated with it, that that trademark is registered. And therefore, we have all of the protections that we get under intellectual property laws, including the penalties for anyone who infringes our rights. Uh, our licensee compliance. So we also have our contractual protections that we get through our license agreement. So that license agreement 
which will be in writing and signed and prepared by a lawyer and not printed off the internet, will have all of the uh, parameters of their use, how, when, who, uh, what, you know, what they can do with your intellectual property material. So you have your statutory rights, meaning the laws, and you have your contractual rights under your license agreement. Uh, also, you know, for your corporate licensee clients, selecting you already have a relationship with them. They've been working with you. They've now converted that relationship to licensee. We trust them. They're not your competitors, right? But when you do that third party provider licensee, we want to make sure that we recruit them and select them very carefully. We want to make sure that they can succeed. We want to make sure that they're trustworthy. They don't have bankruptcies, you, you know. Um, you know, it's funny. I was having a conversation with a client about um, the process for selecting licensees. And I'm like, okay, we know we're going to do a background check. And she she was kind of offended by that. I found, found it really interesting. She's like, well, you know, I, I you know, it's, it's, uh, she felt that it was too controlling. I respectfully disagreed. She's thinking about it. I would uh, encourage a background check. It's not at all unusual. You've probably had to agree to some background checks at, when you're a uh, uh, with some of your clients as well. Um, so you want to make sure you select those licenses very carefully. Um, and then you want to make sure you maintain your market position. You want to still be known as the expert. So you want to make sure your mar your your marketing your license program stays up to date. You want to stay stay you know best in the industry. You want to stay up to date. It is not a set it and forget it. Licensing is not a passive income stream. You still have to make sure your program uh, is is relevant and best in class, and that you're supporting your licensees appropriately. And, uh, and then the financial incentive, it needs to make more sense for them to license from you than to try to recreate it on their own. So these are ways that we make sure that um, we protect your intellectual property and make sure that you have a successful licensing program because it hurts your brand if your licensees don't succeed. So you may be thinking, well, uh, uh, Oh, well, this one first. So what do you do to prepare your business? If you think that your business is ready to look at a licensing program, what do we need to do first? Well, the very first thing I do with my clients is legal due diligence. And that means we make sure that you own everything that you think you own. And, you know, intellectual property assets are different than other assets. You know, the, the rules, you know, like of, of, uh, ownership aren't you know who has who possesses it it's not who paid for it it's not whose idea it was there are very specific rules about who is considered the owner of an intellectual property asset and it's kind of it's not intuitive and people can uh, get in trouble with it so we do legal due diligence so that we make sure that you own what you think you own and you do that by tracking the chain of title we call it right back to the human who created every element uh, in your program. So let's take, for instance, if there's a video in your program, that there are many elements in that video. So somebody wrote the script, a human wrote the script. Uh, there's a host or someone who's speaking on camera or an actor, if it's role playing. Uh, maybe there's some music in there. Somebody wrote the music and performed the music. Somebody held the camera. Photographers are creators. So that applies to videographers as well. Um, maybe you have put some footage from, you know, a research study in there. So somebody owns that uh, uh, footage. So when we do legal due diligence, we track the ownership of every element in your program to make sure that you own it 100%. And so uh, one of the tricky things about intellectual property is that the default is that the human who created whatever the element owns it unless one of two um, circumstances apply. One is they created it as your employee and so uh, in the course of their work. So if they're 
uh, your employee and they create scripts as your employee, you own it immediately, even if you guys don't have an employment agreement. But if they are your W-2 employment, uh, your W-2 employee, meaning you're, you're paying their employment taxes, um, then they're your employee and you own whatever they've created. Um, you know, if they're a knitter on the side, you don't own that, but you own the things that they create during the course of their employment. Uh, if they're not your employee, so it's a subcontractor, uh, 1099, um, and in order for you to own that, there must be an agreement in writing. The only way to transfer the ownership of intellectual property is in writing signed by the parties. So it has to be in writing. So um, if you hire someone, again, to write your script, unless you have something in writing with them, they're going to own that. And what you end up with is you end up with the license to use that script uh, because you paid for it, but you don't end up with the ownership of it. So that is why we want to make sure we go in and do that due diligence before we start building on top of, of your current program. So uh, you may think, well, you know, what's the big deal? I've been using my current program for years, maybe even decades without any problems. And the issue is that increased visibility equals increased scrutiny. As you grow your licensing program, there's going to be more eyeballs on what you've done. And by increased scrutiny doesn't mean you've done anything intentionally wrong. But we have these special intellectual property rules that apply where you may have missed something. And we want to make sure that you haven't missed anything. And um, you know, when you have more eyeballs on something, the possibility of, of things that might have been missed come into light. And so um, we're going to talk about like how this might happen to you. So again, we go back to Sally, our HR consultant. She does that diversity training and she wants to create a licensing program. So Previously, you know, in her in-person training side of her business, she has deliverables and the deliverables for those clients are she has this workshop that she does. She has role playing scripts that she delivers to them. She has some training videos that she delivers to them. She has um, uh, workbooks and she also has a diversity um, supplement for their employee handbook. So those are the, deli the, the deliverables in her current business. So now she's creating a licensing program where she's going to be adding to the number of people who are now laying eyes on her, her, her materials. So what could go wrong? Um, oh, oh, I didn't even know it did that. <laughs> so I'm gonna switch them all down here. Um, so things that can go wrong. Uh, one, with your contractors. So we kind of talked about this just before. So let's say Sally, you know, she is the expert in diversity training. She has a number of role playing scenarios that she wants scripts for that she um, uses in her training. So she hires someone to write those scripts for her. She uses her expertise. She tells her, these are the types of scenarios I want the role playing to cover the writer writes it up, she comes back to her, Sally gives her a note, she goes back, she redoes it, she sends her an invoice, Sally pays the invoice, but she didn't have an agreement in place. Who owns those scripts? Not Sally, the writer owns those scripts. So super important, that's one of those things we wanna catch and clean up during legal due diligence. Things that can go wrong with your employers, and by that I mean your former employers. So here, Sally used to work in the HR department of a big corporation. Her job there was to uh, write the employee handbook. And she is particularly proud of her, the, the provision, the section of it that she did on diversity training. So when she leaves, she takes that section regarding diversity training with her. And her employer, you know, she's doing her one on one consulting work. Your employer, old employer doesn't really care, doesn't notice, it doesn't really matter to them. Um, but then she starts her licensing program. And now instead of, you know, 20 people seeing it this year, 40 people, maybe next year, 60 people are seeing 
that uh, the materials that she took from her old employer. And now, small world, now it comes to the attention of the employer that she, she has and is using the materials that she wrote for her old employer. And as we know, her employer owns 100% of that uh, diversity of materials that she drafted as an employee of her old uh, employer. So we want to make sure that we haven't taken anything that is owned by your old employer with you and put it into your program. Now, of course, you own your expertise, you own your knowledge that you get at your own at your old employer, but you do not own the materials that you created for them. Those are owned by your employers and you cannot use them as the basis for a new licensing program, even if you've gotten away with it in your one on in your one on one work. Um, the same would apply for Sally's employees. Sally hires Sandra and Sandra also came out of, you know, big corp HR, uh, uh, HR department, and she's brought some materials with her that uh, she created for her old employer. And then she contributes them to, to the program. Same problem. Those are owned by uh, Sandra's old employer. And as more eyeballs are on it, the likelihood that that will get back to the employer increases. So we want to make sure that we're not incorporating the materials of your employees, old employers. And you'll actually, if you are hiring employees, you'll want to make sure that you have, um, you know, you're really clear with them when they come in that they aren't bringing any other former employers materials with them. You know, if you've been employed uh, by uh, had an employer within the last 10 years, I'm sure you've had to sign something like that um, when you when you've gone to a new employer as well. Um, other ways we can get in trouble and not own what we think we own is with our client agreements. So, uh, you know, as service providers, I'm sure you have signed many a service agreement uh, presented by your clients. And, um, and I'm sure you are reading them and you know that uh, there will be provisions in there about who owns the deliverables. Now, let's say Sally is signing those service agreements without reading those, those uh, provisions about who owns the deliverables. And the standard agreement mostly always says that the client owns 100% of, of the deliverables. And, uh, and it will be your responsibility to go in there and make sure that you carve out all of your pre-existing materials. So, but Sally hasn't done that. And so all of her, those service agreements say that uh, those deliverables are owned and assigned to the client. So those deliverables are her scripts, her workbooks, her videos. And so, uh, you know, nobody notices while she's doing her one-on-one -on -one work, but then she starts licensing these things out to her new licensees and her new licensing program, gets back to the clients like, wait a minute, I thought you made that for me, I paid for it, here it is in my agreement that I own 100% of that, and that can become a problem. So we wanna make sure that we don't have any lingering issues like that out there where you have inadvertently been assigning the rights in your program to your clients. Um, and the other way that clients can be a problem, well, we like clients, but sometimes our client agreements can be a problem, is if they have uh, non-compete provisions in there. And so maybe in your one-on-one -on -one work, you know, you know all your clients, you know that they don't compete with each other. It's just not been an issue. You've never worried about that non-compete because you know it's not an issue with your clients. Um, but now you're starting to add new licensees and some of them may be in competition with those clients that you've signed non-competes with. Um, so we want to also make sure that you're not going to be in breach in some old non-compete that you signed when you start your licensing program. Um, you know, hopefully you haven't. You've gotten those out of there because you watched a prior IMC webinar that told you not to agree to those. And uh, but we need to then figure out, you know, if that is an issue then you'll need to look at who your licensees are so that you're not going to breach that non-compete depending on who you license to. And then um, the third party materials. 
Um, so let's say Sally uh, took, uh, got a certification in diversity training. And as part of that certification, she received materials that she has a license to use in delivering her one-on-one -on -one client work. But then that's part of the program. But she does not probably have a license to sub-license that. So yes, she can use it to deliver her one-on-one -on -one client work, but she cannot license it to a client or license it to another third-party provider, which would create a sub-license to her license with that third party. Um, it would be unusual that they would have granted her the right to sub-license that material. So we need to make sure that we don't have anything in like that in the program before, because um, then you'd be in breach of your license as well. And you know the reason we want to do the the due diligence and get ahead of these things like, is that we don't want the one, you know, creating a licensing program is an investment. We want to make sure we have something that we own that we really can create a licensing program on top of. And two, that we don't want the hit to our reputation when there are claims made against our program. You know, even if you can clean it up, even if it's, you know, you, you, you make it right and you clean it up, it, it will definitely interfere with your brand and you and that loss of momentum. And so the way I like to look at uh, the legal due diligence as well is you know, what you're currently doing with your IP on a one on one basis. That's the first that's a one story building. Right. And you have a certain foundation and headers and things when you to support a one story building. But when you're adding a licensing program, you're adding a second story to your building. And what foundation was good enough for a one story building may not be good enough for a two story building. So we want to make sure that we have those things in place. And um, and so that is so important to get ahead of those things. So in some, let's see, I'll go back to where we started um, is you know, we talked about what licensing is. Um, it is that agreement in writing that transfers, that grants rights of ownership, grants rights to use um, intellectual property from the owner to a user. Uh, we talked about that train the trainer licensing program when you have corporate clients that need your services on a recurring basis or long-term implementation basis or perhaps you might use it uh, licensed to other providers who provide similar services or complementary services where they're adding what you do to the menu of services that they provide to their clients. Um, we talked about uh, what uh, would be right, uh, what you need to have in place. Pre uh, most importantly, that proprietary methodology or process that you own 100% of and, uh, and also making sure that it's been systematized so that somebody else could deliver it, uh, making sure that, um, uh, that there's a market for it. And of course that it is proven to be effective. Uh, we license the benefits, recurring revenue, predictability, cash flow positive, grow quickly without adding additional expensive resources. And of course the importance of uh, due diligence. So with that, I welcome your questions. Hi, my name is Stephen. I posed a question in the chat. Ah, here we go. Thank you. If you modified and improved the program from the old employer uh, by making the presentation better. So they, they, you do not have the rights to incorporate somebody else's intellectual property and claim it as your own. Um, you may be able to change it so much, and there's no doubt that this happens, that you can change it so much that it is not recognizable as the employer's old um, materials. But in order to do that without breaching their intellectual property rights, you would need to have a license from them, you need to have permission from them to to incorporate that to create derivatives. Um, you, I mean, another I mean, it's a little bit in the weeds. 
And, uh, and I do have, I think my first IMC um, uh, webinar covered the weeds uh, regarding these ownership provisions and licenses. Um, it will talk about whether or not you have the right to create derivatives of somebody else's intellectual property. And that is where that, that would be addressed. Um, you know, one that assumes that you have a license and you probably don't have a license from your employer. Um, and, uh, and so the answer to that is there is risk there. Um, uh, but, you know, again, if you can, you know, transform it so that it is unrecognizable, then, uh, then that is, is something that has less risk to it. Uh, let's see, Lois, what types of methods approach are considered general use and not protected IP? So, uh, I, they want to, I mean, if you have something like, let's say you are an accountant and you're just following, you know, gap, um, uh, protocol, there's nothing exclusive about that. Um, you're a bookkeeper and you, you know, you make sure that everything adds up. Um, you're a lawyer and you, <laughs> and you make sure that, uh, that, um, things are, are in compliance with the law. Um, so there, you would need to like, there's you, again, you know, uh, as you're, as the expert, hopefully you have found some patterns, you know, like you, like you, Lois, for instance, working in the postal, um, industry and printing and postal industry over the course of time working in that you've noticed some patterns and you have incorporated that into the materials that you're using that it would be unique that other people who are management consultants don't know because they don't have the depth of experience that you have. So, so that would be an example. Um, I am planning on licensing in combination with a certification with CEU requirements each year. What can you share regarding this model structure? Yeah, so um, certification is when you combine the license with some training that also requires some proof of uh, mastery. And so these would be continuing education units. Is that what the CEU is um, requirement every year? And, uh, and the, the trick here is to make sure that you don't get too close to the franchise line um, and people can trip into that. So if you are creating a certification program that someone is basing their entire business on and that certification program includes, you know, you must use these materials, you must use them this way, you must structure your business this way, you must charge this way, um, you, you start to get close to the, the franchise line. But so long as it's truly just, I am training you to become, you know, competent in delivering this process. And I'm asking you to recertify on a regular basis. Um, then you are, you know, certification plus training and mastery. Um, you get there. So that that is um, that's fine, too. Um, one of the things there, I mean, probably we're talking about, um, you know, third party providers and not clients. And so you know, you'll have to decide what the requirements are to, to, you know, be part of your certification program. Um, Cause there may be some people who can do all these things, but you still, you know, want to protect your brand um, by making sure you're clear about that. So, um, and, and I, I want to mention with franchises and why franchises become a problem is that every, when everyone's happy, they have the franchise, you know, or, or let's say, it's a certification, but it's a franchise in disguise. You call it a certification, but it's really a franchise. And it becomes a problem when you do a certification and um, and then they do something wrong and you decide I'm not gonna renew your certification. And their entire business was what they got from you from their certification. And so they lose their certification, their business goes away. That's pretty much a sign that it was a franchise and they will have a claim against you to saying that it was a franchise and I had some rights. And so, um, and that's when people get in trouble. It's, you know, when everyone's happy, there's no issue, nobody cares. But when somebody loses that certification, therefore they lose like, you know, their business, that's when the lawsuit starts. And that's when why you wanna be careful with that. Uh, 
I think Patricia had a question in the chat about oh, um, where is it? it's uh, above the, where you were before. Oh. Uh, do I, do need, I to need to trademark? Oh, okay, sorry. So uh, no, because trademark doesn't apply to all of your materials. So there's two different uh, types of intellectual property that we'll talk about here, because I'm going to assume patents don't apply and trade secrets is the other kind. Trade secrets aren't appropriate for licensing because obviously you're sharing them with your licensees. Trade secrets have value because they stay secret. So we're going to, so that the, the uh, the types of intellectual property that would apply here would be copyright and trademark. And so you get copyright protection for those things that you put down, that you express an idea. So the training materials, the videos, the scripts, the um, you know policy manuals, whatever it is, whatever your training materials are, um, your, your presentations, um, those things you register in the copyright office, your books, your white papers, those you register for copyright protection. Your trademarks are those things that signify the origin. So that would be your company name or your logo or your log line, your tagline. Um, so those are things that get trademark protection. Those, those um, you, you do not trademark your expressions um, that you put down uh, in long form. So, but yes, you do want to protect the everything, but it may be copyright versus trademark. It's Lois, I have a question. So it, I think I can tell sort of by, by the head nodding that people obviously recognize they need to take some action with um, some of the suggestions you're giving us. So I think the question is like, where do you start? If, 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 we, if we wanna go down the route of just protecting our materials before we bring on contractors or before we bring on other consultants, or we're gonna pursue this licensing sort of, can you give us some uh, high level, you should do this first, this second, this third? Yes. Well, you want to have copyright protection for all of your materials. Now, I will say this, you know, copyright protection attaches at the moment of creation. So even if you never register it, you know, you write uh, an, uh, a white paper um, regarding, uh, you know, it, it, copyright protection attaches at the moment that you create it. You register it because you put the world on notice. Like, let's say you have your white paper and you offer it on your website. You, it puts the world on notice that this is not, you know, in public domain, as they, people think everything on the internet is, that it is owned, it is protected, copyrighted materials, and it also tells them who owns it. Um, and the other thing is if somebody copies it, which happens, unfortunately, someone downloads it and puts it on their website in order to pursue them and enforce your copyright, it has to be registered. So, and it's a deterrent. So register, um, your, uh, you know, have copyright notices as well on your website, on the, you know, your handouts, on your presentations. Um, and so copyright would be number one. Um, copyright protection is a DIY. You can do that online at the Copyright Office. Um, it requires you to submit a, a sample of, well, uh, one, one version of it. Um, and, uh, it's fairly, I want to say it's 30 bucks per, um, and, uh, and then you can, um, you have that. So you have record that this is your original material, um, and that you can enforce it. Um, uh, the, I'm not sure if that maybe this, maybe this one, the second one is even more important is those written agreements. Super, super, super important. Again, uh, the only way to make sure you own the things that you're paying for is if you have agreements in writing with your contractors. And so that would be my number one thing. And also when you have, are signing those service agreements with your clients, make sure you are reading and understand who owns the deliverables, because if those deliverables include your proprietary methodology, um, you want to make sure that they only have the, the right to use it in the way that you're delivering it and not that they do not have the right to sub-license it, create derivatives, 
and use it for other for other purposes. And then make sure everything's registered. Sharon. Uh, so you're Andrew, on mute, Linda. Yes, I realized that. <laughs> Uh, if someone wanted to reach out and and have you help them with some of this, how might they uh, get in touch with you? Oh, well, I have a slide for that. <laughs> I thought maybe you might. <laughs> oh, let's see if I can find it without making anyone sick. All right. <coughs> Oops, what did I do? There it is. I should be able to make this big, but uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I am the original Aaron Austin because I've been there so long. And uh, and then my website is thinkbeyondip.com or shoot me a note at Aaron at thinkbeyondip.com. I'd love to hear from you. And also I, I do have a, um, a podcast called Hourly to Exit, um, I guess. That should be on here too. <laughs> so you can, I'll, 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 every place you get podcasts, you can uh, look for hourly to exit. And I also have a weekly newsletter where I talk about kind of that journey from hourly to exit. So I'd love to have you join me there as well. And I get uh, Aaron's newsletter and it's um, very helpful. Periodically, I'll take a tidbit out of there that I can use. Good. Aaron, we'd like to thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and expertise and your time with us today to really provide insights and approaches that uh, obviously make a dis dis difference for all of our consulting practices. And um, I, if anyone, uh, Linda's put a whole bunch of things in the chat um, in terms of contacting Aaron, should you need more information? And I hope you'll consider joining us at our happier event next Wednesday, May 18th, where we'll have a, a, an open dialogue and discussion on managing client relationships. And you will you can see that also on Eventbrite. And we will have a speaker for next week, uh, excuse me, for next month. And you'll uh, also get updates in the um, IMC NCR email that we will send out in the coming weeks. Thank you all, it's been a joy, thank you. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Erin, very good.